I'm standing in my father's bedroom. There's a leopard in the closet and man with machete is walking outside the window. The men outside are whispering as he and they're sleeping. The leopard is trying to get out of the closet and I'm standing there thinking, how am I gonna get us both out of this scary, life-threatening situation? So I decided to walk up to the closet. I opened the closet and I spoke to the leopard. I said, can you please get out of here? It's way too small for you anyhow and you could use some fresh air. <laughs> I walked up to the window and I spoke to the man outside. I said, there's a very hungry leopard on his way out. Now their whispering voices became one with the wind and there was silence. I turned around to my father who was in lying in bed all along and I said, Pa, can you still hear anything or see anything? And he had a smile on his face, a smile of relief and he said, no, no, they're all gone. That day I felt really close to my father. I felt like we were a team a team that had achieved something together. You see, my dad was schizophrenic, and since I was a kid, I spent most of my time trying to understand him. I mean, he fascinated me. He would graffiti secret codes around the house. He would see ultraviolet rays come out of your mouth as you spoke. He had amazing theories about life and death. And he heard voices that I couldn't hear. Normally in these kind of situations, I would go into his bedroom and say, Pa, there's really no leopard here, no man with machetes. It's all in your mind. But that day I did something different. I decided to leave my reality and step into his, his vision. And we had a much better outcome of a situation that was scary for him, also for me. And I didn't know it then, but actually filling this gap between vision and reality would be something that I would use to start projects. Now, my dad was also very passionate about music. It was a passion that we shared. It was our common reality, as it were. He would play different instruments around the house and made different kind of music. But I wanted to do something else. I wanted to make music that I could share with the world. I remember I used to sit a lot on top of our car and look up to the stars and dream about how I could make music that could be like a way for me to get out of the island and learn more and study music. You see, dreams and visions for me are like an empty white circle that when you fill that circle, you make your visions reality. I remember when my mother heard about my dreams and vision she saved for months and bought me my first guitar. I was really happy about this. As a kid, I got my first guitar. I took some guitar lessons. But I felt like I needed more. I needed to do something else for, to fill this gap and make my own songs that I can share with the world. One day I went to a bookstore. I was looking for inspiration, magazines about music to see what was going on. I saw this magazine and it had on the front cover, it said, Sampler's Rule. I read it and it had an article about a DJ that used this technology called Sampler to make his album. And I got really inspired. I called up a DJ on the island that I heard that had one of these magical machines. And he taught me all about sampling. You see, sampling is a, is a technique that you can record sounds, even your voice or snippets of sound or existing songs, whatever, and you manipulate it, you stretch it, you pitch it up, and you make your own sound with it, that you can make your own music with it. <coughs> so after a few studio sessions with this guy, I made my first song with a sampler, and it sounded something like this. <laughs> I didn't know what to call it, so I called it some Caribbean music. <laughs> no, it was also this song that helped me fill that gap between my dreams to go out of the island and study. And I was accepted into a school in Holland uh, to study music, technology, composition and production. 
And it was during this, uh, during a course on ethnomusicology, it's called, it's the study of music and culture, that a professor asked me, so Michael, tell me about your musical identity and musical tradition of your island of Aruba. Now, I explained to him what I knew about what we had on the island, and uh, I felt like I couldn't really answer the question. And I thought it was also a very important question for myself to answer because it was my island and I was doing music and I wanted to know what our music tradition and identity was. So after my studies, I went back to the island to do research on this. And uh, I asked many of my friends and uh, I realized that they didn't know what their musical tradition were either. And I felt like, you know, I realized actually that we had a big gap between a younger generation and the older generation. And after doing more research and a project on this gap, I met two guardians of the traditional music. One was Bucci, he was about 80 years old, he made Caja di Orgel, and the other one was Vicente, he was about 82 years old and he was all about the tambu. Now, these guys taught me a lot about the musical instrument. More importantly, they taught me about the musical tradition of the island found a musical identity there of our island and I was really, really inspired. I was really excited about this. I started envisioning that I could use this musical identity that we had on the island and combine it with my own electronic music and make something new out of it and make my own musical identity. Bucci and Vicente weren't so happy about this. <laughs> they thought, here comes this guy, he's gonna change our musical tradition something we've been safeguarding for their entire life, you can say. But they were open to talk to me about the new ideas. So I spent some time with Bucci. He explained to me about the Cahi Orgel, a cylinder organ it's called, and all the strings and how they use bike spokes to, uh, to make this. And it take a, takes about like six months before he can finish one of them. It's a full craftsmanship. One day I asked him if I could sample this, basically recording it note by note. He said, okay, so I did. I sampled it note by note, I put it into my computer, into the sampling technology that I've learned, and I had the whole sound of the traditional caja de orgel in my computer so I could make any kind of music, rhythms, melodies with this sound. I got so inspired, I made an album using the sound of the Cahi Orgel, and I can let you hear a snippet of it as well. I also spent a lot of time with Vicente and his tambu. He taught me a lot about the rhythms we had on the island. You see in Aruba there is four rhythms. I didn't know about this, but he taught me that we have four rhythms that we play on the island of Aruba that you don't play on the other islands. The other islands have their own rhythm. I thought this was fascinating. I got really inspired. So I also made an album inspired by these four rhythms. I sampled, recorded them and made my own music with it. One day I got a phone call from Vicente. He said, Michael, can you please drop by? I wasn't, you know, I was a bit hesitant about this because I thought he heard the album and he didn't like what I did. <laughs> so I arrived at his house. There he was sitting in his veranda with a small CD player, his tambu. He had a piece of paper with some notes on it. I said, hello, I sat down. I was still a bit nervous because I didn't know what was coming. And after a while he pressed play and he started playing my CD. Not only was he playing the CD, he was playing along on his tambu with the music that I made. He was looking at his notes and he then told me that he's been practicing after he heard the CD, he understood and he's been practicing. I, I was like sitting there like I felt like a kid, you know, I was like, wow, we had filled this gap between our generations. We understood each other and 
since then he's been making music with this project. We even made an album where he played on it as well. We have a snippet of that as well. Frequent in dimension, no cucuta apri, vida cucuta pria, con su rayo tan ferviente. After this, he even went on a tour with me in Holland. I know, right? So after doing all these projects, working with different people, I started a new vision. I started a vision of having a place, a creative platform, a creative center where we can all come together, not only for my projects, but creatives from all areas and backgrounds can come together, can inspire each other, and we can make our dreams, ideas, visions become reality. It's my current gap at the moment, the challenge, but you know, it's, it's not easy to fill this gap between visions and, and reality. But I'm grateful for that experience that day with my father in his bedroom. Because it taught me the power of belief. I mean, he did truly believe in the vision that there was a leopard and man with machetes there. The belief was so strong that I, at one point, had to step into his reality. So I learned that if you truly and utterly believe in your ideas, dreams and visions, they will become reality. Thank you.